Good to see you. Listen that. You too, man. Finally, on the brown couch. The last time we seen each other was on a very messy night out in Ibiza. That's right. We were rolling in fact, with our well, mates. Serge, uh, remember the picture the three of us done? Yeah. Serge got that picture blown up for us and I've got it in the house, but there's, uh, we all look pretty Tired. But, uh, but the, the, there's a great, in, right in the corner of the picture, you can see a hand coming out, he's literally holding Serge up. <laughs> he was, just a, this phantom hand like that. He was f***ing tired. Yeah, no, it wasn't yeah. he really he looked, was. he looked like a vampire. Yeah. By the, cause he had a, did, he have a, did he have a cape on? He might have had a cape on and a big <laughs> I hand. I don't know. Just for a change. Yeah, yeah. Can't have been easy, man, because I'm looking at the 18 tracks in front of me right here. There are some omissions, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but you did make a big deal out of also saying, because you could have done it yourselves and you could have taken it out of the control of the record label, but not made a big deal about that. But you really wanted everyone to know that this was something the band as a whole, as a democracy, had sat down and done. Together. Well, not, not, so much, right, not so much as a democracy, because Gem, Gem and Andy were, weren't in the band for huge chunks of, mm. of the songs that, that made up the record. And when it came to picking the tracks, Liam as I recall, was walking around there, I got put, it was, it was in Argentina on the tour, I got asked to do the track listing, Liam walked past me in the corridor with uh, a turban on his head, with two pints of vodka and cranberry juice going to the pool to uh, leather the kit journalist from Q, who'd misquoted him in a previous interview. I've, got that, I've still got that article <laughs> in my bathroom, man, I read it about three days ago. Yeah. So I was like, any idea the track tra listing? No? Song but Yeah, fine. You know, put, put Songbird on. Yeah. Yeah, right. As long as uh, I get yeah. my points, I'm all right. Yeah, that's that same as Songbird on it. Yeah, I'll yeah. see you in the bar. Yeah. So um, it, wasn't, it wasn't really a democratic choice. In order and everything. <laughs> so it starts with Rock and Roll and ends yeah. with uh, Don't Look Back in Anger. It's just a case of filling, yeah. filling the gaps. And by, I put it together like a set list. would be like, right, what well, if I, if I, if I wanted to go and see my favourite band mm. and I wanted them to play my favourite songs, how would it all run? Can I guess what goes second then? <laughs> my favourite set list out of what would go, so it starts with Rock and Roll then it goes Supersonic. Some might say it goes. So one, two, punch, Supersonic see. kicks in side two, I think. Does it? Yeah. Killer track. Yeah. Well, I still, it's still, it's still one of my favourite ever. Oh man, that song stands up. I tell yeah. you, that was the first thing I ever heard you guys do because I was living in New Zealand at the time, and we, had, you know, British rock and roll hadn't really. It just started to permeate down under at that mm. point because we were in a whole grunge thing. And I remember the first time I saw that video and heard that song. It was bleak. The video wasn't f f fancy at all. Raining puddles, the yeah. whole works. You know, Liam giving it some up at the camera. Yeah. But just when that beat kicks in and then the guitar starts, and I just remember thinking, man, I haven't heard anything like this for a long time. You know? Yeah, but it's just I, the thing I like about that song is it's just slow enough. Yeah. Because it could, if you do it too fast, it would be nonsense, but it's just slow enough. It's about 95 beats per minute, I think, around there? No, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it is on the, sure. on the BPMs, but it's just, it's, just, it's just sleazy and... Yeah. And it's a rough mix of a demo, do you know what I mean? We never really recorded that for the album. Yeah. But all, all, that, all that definitely maybe era songs, they all stand up because they were recorded, you know, by... We were all in our 20s then, do you know what I mean? Or Liam was... Probably about 19, do you know what I mean? So yeah. the, and all, all the sentiments of those songs still hold true today, so... It'll, 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 it'll never date that album. A certain amount of uh, the naivety as well, as you, as you point out, being young and kind of getting the excitement of going in a studio and having those songs and not worrying about overproducing and not mm. worrying about record sales, all that kind of stuff. It can only happen once in your life, can't it, really, as a band? Yeah, because the second, the second time around we were doing Morning Glory, although the approach was even more haphazard, it took less time. Mm. Um, um, but we knew what our audience was then, if you like. Whereas mm. before we got on that album, we'd never kind of, we hadn't done that many gigs, do you know what I mean? So mm. we didn't know who these songs were for. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd written them a, a few years beforehand, but when we came to the Morning Glory, we knew who the kids were, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it was the fastest, I mean, definitely maybe it was the fastest selling debut album of all time at the time. Mm. Um, Mantle that was subsequently broken by Hearsay and then subsequently reclaimed by the great art Dead Monkeys, Absolutely. Thank, thank God. Yeah. Um, were you, did you even see this coming at any, but it, it, in any stretch of the imagination when, when the record came out in the first week? Did anyone even say to you, even say three days beforehand, look, we might, something, something big's happening here? I didn't, not in terms of record sales and not in terms of, I knew, I knew, that we were going to be at some point the biggest band in the world, but I didn't. Is that I blind faith, or is that something <clears throat> to build on I, facts as well? No, I don't know. I just, I just, because I know enough about music, and I and I buy enough contemporary music to know that we were the. Mm. F you know what I mean? And when if and when we got that record right, I, I just knew it, you know. And but I didn't, I didn't foresee 
because it was going like that would definitely maybe then once Wonderwall came out it went like that I didn't I didn't see that at all I, ex mm. I kind of I expected to be in the biggest band in the world eventually but I didn't expect it to happen within the first three years When you're looking through the history, right from you know being, when you were born, right up to you know discovering music, because your other activities were getting you in trouble. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's kind of what saves you. And all those things that can, basically you get a two op two op options in your life at that point, don't you? When you've got those yeah. those circumstances, it's either go down the rabbit hole or find something to pull you out. You just I just felt, and only in hindsight, at, at the time, you know, you think you don't think anything about having. You don't think anything that you can somehow, as if by magic, play the guitar, you know, because you're, too, you're like 19 and you think, well, of course, you know, it's a natural thing to pick up and play. In hindsight, you look back on it now and just think, I was just so lucky to even have an interest in a musical instrument. Because yeah. if you'd see the, the kind of 15 or 20 lads I used to hang about with in, uh, in Levengym in Manchester, you'd realise what a colossal achievement even as a person, we mm. me, me and Liam have achieved because the the other lads, bless them, are all kind of they don't do much. Do you know mm. what I mean? Mm. Were you frowned upon? Is it because a lot of kids watch this? Well, a few kids watch this show, <laughs> and you know, I mean, a lot of them probably find themselves looking for for, for, for things to inspire them and to get them out of an everyday predicament of being a bored ass teenager. And a lot a lot of cases, people frown upon it when you have any ambition, don't they? You know? I tell you a true story, right? <coughs> I, I kind of I mm. used to stay in. I remember staying in constantly for a couple of years playing just playing the guitar, being ob obsessing about it, and my mum, bless her, saying, you know, you're kind of 19, you know, and you kind of sit in your bedroom all night with this guitar and you don't have a girlfriend, is there anything you want to tell me? And I'm like, <laughs> are you insinuating that I'm gay, mother? You know, and she's going, well, you know, Why, because I play an instrument? Don't, yeah, and that Liam thought I was weird. <laughs> Weirdo. He went up there with his guitar. The 19s is quite, it's quite a late, uh, it's quite a late time to start picking up an instrument as well. Well, I'd, I'd had it, I'd had, there'd been a guitar in our house since when we were, I guess, early teenagers, but I'd never really, I'd never really taken much interest in it, mm. do you know what I mean? Because mm. it was a big acoustic guitar. And you, like, well, you, mean, you want to look, rock at that age, don't you? You know, you're straight in there. Well, I was in a, I was in a football at that age, and I wasn't, I didn't, because I, I thought rock stars came from Mars, like David Bowie and Mark Boland and that, and you know, and you have to be, I didn't think until the Stone Roses came along and the Smiths that, mm. hang on a minute, lads like us can actually be on top of the pop. So it was only, it was only with, I guess, New Order and the Smiths and then the Stone Roses and, and the Manchester thing starting mm. that it was... Well, it's in your backyard, isn't it? And all yeah. of a sudden it's more than achievable. But up, up, up until that point, I thought all rock stars came from London. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the first time like playing Top of the Pops? Do you remember what, what you did and what that was like? It was off. It's Top of the Pops, man. I think that's when my mum started taking it seriously. Mm. And she said, right, we're on Top of the Pops tonight. And she's like, oh, right. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but I think it's a shame that programme's gone now. Because, yeah. you know, there would always be this excitement. When we when Supersonic came out and we didn't get Top of the Pops because it went in at 31, mm. we were devastated because you know, it's top of the pops, and then the next time it come around and we got it, I just can't see kids being excited now, you know, following it in bands for each other, going, hey, we got a uh, transmission, yeah, yeah, four, yeah, you know, yeah, top yeah, of the pops. Yeah, yeah. I hope they bring it back soon. Well, you know, there definitely is, uh, there's something missing, I think, on a terrestrial level anyway, in terms We've got of Jules Holland, show. brilliant. <laughs> and so it begins. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Live Forever, man, voted f uh, um, by many magazines, and most famously, and recently, I think it was, was it Q? Or, yeah. Uh, as, as the best song of all time. Yeah. Well, you can't argue with the public, can you? Uh, when you wrote that, come on, man, did you know? Did you know in yeah. your heart of hearts? Yeah. That was the one? Yeah. And you wrote it when you were working in a factory, is that right? One of the early ones? Uh, I, w and I was on the door when I wrote that. That was one of the, that was one of the later ones of Definitely Maybe. That's mm. when I knew, after I'd finished that song, my songwriting changed.